yeah so yeah so how was your day today what have you been what have you been up to oh not a ton I just like <laughs> shoveling and like preparing for this interview and yeah. I have some stocks that I'm monitoring and oh nice yeah you guys got a lot of snow there or uh just like slush oh mm. like I, it's like an ice storm oh so, god that does gross. not sound fun it's yeah. it's finally starting to get warmer here I mean warmer as in like 10 degrees <laughs> yeah. but yeah that's that's exciting uh so I guess yeah tell me a little bit about um who you are and what kind of got you into Flora Funga Farms. Um, who am I? Interesting. I'm obsessed <laughs> with nature and mushrooms. Um, and uh, I didn't used to be, though, like, I, I don't know, like 10 years ago, I didn't know a pine tree from a spruce tree. Um, so, like, I was totally clueless. Um, and then in college, I, um, had like a ton of changes in my lifestyle and in um, my interests. And I just got exposed to so many new ideas, um, especially my, my botany professor and like all the guest lecturers we had mm -hmm. uh, in that class were just amazing. Like this guy, Greg Marley, who's a, a author from Maine, he writes books about mushrooms. He came to our class and took us on like a guided foraging tour Oh, that's cool. And that was my first experience going out in the woods with someone who was like totally open and willing to share all of their knowledge, you know, like, oh, and like over here one time I found this mushroom and like, you know, like, and so we would all, the whole class broke up and like went out into the woods and found whatever they could find. And then we all came back and like sat in a circle on the forest floor and like spread out all the mushrooms we'd collected. And then he just like, we just went around the circle and he told us like about each mushroom and like how to identify it and all this stuff. And wow. Um, so that was a really inspiring experience. Yeah. Um, and like the next day I found one of the medicinal mushrooms that he had talked about in his talk Ooh. and like brought it home and checked my findings and then cooked <laughs> it and ate it and like was hooked after that. Like that was it. Was Which like, one was it that you it found? Was, uh, lion's mane mushroom oh or that's a great first find what bear's head tooth uh, okay. americanum um which is like just as medicinal medicinal as the true lion's mane but it's um slightly different species mm -hmm. but they're closely related yeah uh, but yeah wow. absolutely gorgeous mushroom um delicious and it changed my life awesome wow uh, yeah so then what uh so from that experience you were like oh I kind of want to share this with other people or you want other people to get involved yeah like yeah. what kind of set that fire of flora funga farms um so I've always been someone who learns best by like teaching mm -hmm. so I um you know I'll learn some about something and then I'll like talk everybody's ear off about it um yeah. whether they they want to hear it or not sometimes yep <laughs> um, but like yeah so I uh I got wait sorry what was the question one more time uh what kind of got you into creating your own like farm in a way and oh, yeah. yeah um so like my interests I guess sort of yeah stemmed from wanting to to share and teach Mm -hmm. um, and so where we're at now with Flora Funga Farms is um, we're still in the early, early stages. So as of now, we're just doing guided foraging tours. Okay. Um, in the summer or, or like in the mushroom season, you know, like right. out, um, which is like anywhere from May through end of November, usually, um, at okay. least around here. Mm -hmm. There's a little more of a season if you're in like Mississippi or, or somewhere warmer. Yeah. Um, Southern. Okay. Yeah. But the... Uh, yeah, we're on the coast of Maine, like down east Maine. Um, and so the it's warmer than, you know, central or northern Maine, but it's still pretty cold. Um, okay. A lot of the a lot of the time. Like we don't really have springtime. It's like snowing <laughs> in May. Um, <laughs> yep, I feel that. It's like two weeks of like normal weather and then either yeah. hot or cold. 
So I wanted, um, I, I know I know plenty of people who mushroom hunt and then I spent some time on the West Coast and like a lot of people there. Mm -hmm. right? And it's really hard there to find people who are willing to share their knowledge. Um, really? Some people are totally willing to like, and you can find them on Facebook and stuff. And But there's a lot of people with this mentality of like, I will never share my secret mushroom. Mm -hmm. And okay. it's like, it makes sense if you're like if you're dependent on that for income mm -hmm. but it's a dangerous game to be dependent on foraging for income because it it tends to make people make really um greedy decisions yeah uh, because like you have to be very mindful of like okay yeah i want to make money but like is what i'm doing like sustainable um, right and so for things like mushrooms it's not as much of a big deal because the mushroom is kind of like an apple on an apple tree. You know, it's just the reproductive structure. Mm -hmm. So if you harvest 50 pounds of chicken of the woods, even before it goes to spore, you're probably not like ruining that organism's chance of reproduction completely. Right. Um, probably be able to like squeeze off a few more mushrooms in the coming years or in that same year mm. and produce enough spores to reproduce. So it's like, but with things like ramps and fiddleheads, um, right it's actually becoming a problem in Maine where people are like going out and harvesting ridiculous amounts of these things, okay. just like decimating populations. Um, and, you know, just for money, like, right. Yeah. Like part of it, you know, like part of me, my interest in doing this is financial, but that's barely a part mm -hmm. of it. Like I was originally trying to be a chemical engineer, you know, before I discovered my nature obsession, um, and so I would have just been like grinding a nine to five my whole life, you know, um, working for like Dow chemical or something. Okay. And that's like another thing where I'm like, I have this, um, you know, I think if there's a struggle between like, as a human being, you want to like not struggle all the time. Mm -hmm. You also want, like, there's also this, at least for me that I've now discovered this like desire to connect with nature. Um, and that's actually much more powerful for me than this desire to like avoid the struggle of being poor. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. I'm rambling now. So no, I love it. I love it. I love all of this. Yeah. So like in terms of our, like our strategy uh, at Flora Funga Farms, it's like um, aside from the guided foraging tours that we mm -hmm. do, um, our next steps are to buy land of our own and then um, start work on our permaculture set up there. Okay. And what is permaculture? Uh, permaculture is sort of like a broad descriptor. It's like a, a strategy, you could say, of, um, of working with ecosystems in their whole form in order to produce goods or like uh, crops, you could okay. say. So, instead of you know cutting down the forest so that the sunlight can reach the ground and then tilling up the ground and planting rows of crops and like ruining the watershed um, and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. What you can do is just like um, trim some of the treetops to let more light in um, and you can inoculate trees while they're still standing with fungi True. so that those trees will um, begin to decompose and produce mushrooms that are, you know, if you use edible and medicinal species, mm -hmm. and then, you know, eventually they will be blown down and decompose into soil. And so you're basically allowing nature to take its normal course, but you're also like managing it um, in a sustainable way so that you can be constantly reaping um, benefits from right. that ecosystem. So it's like, okay. instead of, you know, forcing the ground to produce crops and then being like, oh, the ground is empty of nitrogen. <laughs> All right. Some purified nitrogen in there so it, we can squeeze another cucumber out of it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> our goal is to like let the forest do its thing, but just like in a way that also produces as many medicinal and edible plants and fungi as possible. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Like yeah. optimizing the land. Yeah, like a food forest. Right. Yeah. Like some people could do like plant uh, 
shade liking or loving plants or stuff in the shaded area instead of like trying to swap that around like you like um yeah fill in where the plants like it or stuff like that yeah and it's like the opposite of a monoculture i mean like right you have like even the same tree, you could have multiple species of mushrooms inoculated. That's true. Yeah, never really like think about using the tree trunks as like your own like permaculture situation. Yeah, like, so people are like, oh yeah, so you have to go and cut down a fresh oak tree. Or let's say you <laughs> knock it. So you have to cut down a fresh oak tree, uh -huh. pop it into logs, stack the logs up off the ground so the slugs can't get to them. Right. And inoculate them and like soak them with water and stuff. But it's like the tree, when it's standing up, it has roots in the ground that mm -hmm. are constantly absorbing water. So it's perfectly wet. Yeah. And it's already standing up where the slugs can't get it. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't you just not cut it down? Yeah, that seems way more water. efficient. And so the tree is actually able to continue to live for a little while because most fungi that you're inoculating are eating the heartwood of the tree. Mm -hmm. So the cambium or the outer bark is still like happily alive um for you know until the tree falls down from right forward. um but yeah and that's something that's happening all the time in the natural world like i mean if you've ever seen somebody's tree fall on their house or something it's probably because a fungus ate the heartwood of the tree okay. um, yeah, most trees sense. that you see fall over they either fall over because the soil is too thin for them to hold themselves up or a fungus has destroyed the internal structure oh. so if you see mushrooms coming out of a tree, mm -hmm. uh, steer clear of that tree on a windy day. <laughs> <laughs> and don't build a house near it. <laughs> yeah, or like, yeah, maybe cut that tree down. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, okay. Anyway. Yeah, so do you have uh, like your own greenhouse system or do you you grow your own mushrooms or uh, uh, yeah, plants so and stuff? Or We're in like the research and development phase, I would say, for like uh, our mushroom growing. Okay. Um, because we're just, we're still trying to, we kind of hit a speed bump with the whole COVID thing. So, right. um, we are probably looking at a couple years before we're like totally, you know, in integrated into the community. Um, we'll be doing CSAs. We'll be doing, um, selling mushrooms at the farmer's market. And yeah, so right now we just have like a greenhouse in my mother's side yard. Okay. Um, it's like a little hoop house. Um, and that's like our test that's like our test zone, like our mm -hmm. little testing lab. So we have, um, and that's where we'll be just like trying out different strains of mushrooms, um, getting them, getting the mycelium cultivated. And mm -hmm. then from there we can start testing. Um, there's several acres of woods around here too, that we can test our, uh, we call it gorilla inoculation. Cause it's like, you know, kind of like how gorilla warfare is this idea that you're like taking advantage of what, structures and things are around you in order to set up like uh in this case of you know a strategy of whatever horrible things happen in war but oh. like we're in this case it's like with mushrooms so we're like going into the woods and finding you know trees that look like they would be perfect to inoculate with certain species okay so like okay. hemlock trees get inoculated with um reishi mushrooms mm -hmm. and um, oak trees can be inoculated with like a wide variety of things, you know, oysters, lion's mane, um, namenkos, enokis, like mm -hmm. all kinds of different really tasty edible and medicinal mushrooms. Okay. And mm -hmm. what, sorry, did you? Oh, no, sorry. Um, what is your like uh, choice of cultivating? Like how do you usually, like what's your preferred method? of how to start the mycelium and stuff? So there's two, there, well, there's several different ways you can do it, the, mm -hmm. but the main categories are, there's like a, what they call a sterile or a, or a aseptic technique. And then there's um, fermentation technique. So with a sterilization technique, you basically take what's called a substrate, which is like what the mushroom wants to eat. So in the case of oyster mushrooms, that could be straw or it could be like, um, maple sawdust or something okay. like that that has the cellulose and stuff in it that they want to eat and you just like moisturize that stuff and put it in like a sealed container and then you pressure cook it for um, like 
extended period of time, um, like an hour or something at 15 PSI. And what that does is it just like kills everything in it. Um, okay. And then you just take a little piece of living mycelium or some spores or something. Mycelium is a little easier because it's easier to purify it. Right. Um, like it's less likely to be contaminated. And then you just pop that in there. Um, mm. you know, obviously you have to do that under sterile conditions or all the right. spores and air will contaminate you. Right. Very, very tricky to, um, to cultivate fungi using a sterile technique. You need like very sterile conditions mm -hmm. like um, a container with like, yeah, like yeah. You need, like, either like a special like airflow filtered air hood or like uh they make like you can make like a, a steel air box mm -hmm. just a box that you pump full of lysol oh and it has gloves <laughs> like built into it oh that my you're, gosh like, reaching in like if you've ever seen like a sci-fi movie where they're yeah like <laughs> bubble boy or something or yeah and they're like oh my god they've got their hand in the glove box you know um it's that's literally like what you have to use yeah um, so it, wow. it can be difficult to to kind of launch you know like a mom and pop mushroom grow because you need a lot of like special equipment mm -hmm. um, and I mean fortunately like we have most of the equipment we need at this point so oh, we're like good. almost ready to go okay um, it's just a matter of testing our techniques um and getting everything started and then like also gathering enough capital um, right to be able to like withstand bad months mm -hmm. if we, like if we you know don't if all our mushrooms like don't produce because it's dry as a bone or something mm -hmm. um that's one of the issues is like if you're not using you know um an indoor grow room where you can perfectly manipulate the conditions, um, you're subject to environmental changes. So there's a lot of, uh, it's yeah, anyway, it's complicated. Yeah, yeah room for yeah. air. Um, but yeah, like our goal is to, to do CSAs and um, to have enough mushrooms and stuff to, to bring to market and to local co-ops and stuff. Yeah, and for people that don't know what a CSA is, can you, I guess, talk about what a CSA is and how that would be beneficial for Triple uh, F or do you say Flora Funga Farms every time? I mean, Triple F is fine, yeah. Or like FFF or uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> farms, yeah, whatever. We're 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 brand new. We're still starting. Yeah. So. Um. But yeah, I chose a part of the reason I like the name so much is um, I don't know. I just like Fs. It's okay. Good yeah, but I also, you know, love plants and fungi. Um, yeah. But it's a kind of a catchy name. Yeah, I love the fungi mm -hmm. part. Um, so CSAs are like a a means of connecting farmers and consumers. So um, it's basically like a typically takes the form of a subscription service. So the consumer will pay the farmer a subscription fee for the season. So it's like a one time fee. Let's say two hundred dollars. Okay for six months and then every two weeks or every month depending on what you've signed up for mm -hmm. um the farm will go and they do their normal harvest and they'll fill your box up with whatever they're currently harvesting okay. um, and then deliver that to the consumer um so like a csa for mushrooms or for us would look like a box full of edible and medicinal mushrooms um like herbs for cooking or for tea for medicine um and then also like some forest products as well so things like in the early spring we would do things like birch sap or um oh. and then it, you know in the fall and winter we might do something like um we might do like wreaths or or some other like forest product oh, that we, that's cool that we can sustainably harvest from um when there aren't as many mushrooms and things yeah like um, so we're, we're really interested in not only just like selling things to make money we're really interested in in connecting people to the kinds of things that our local ecosystem has to offer yeah because a lot of people don't know that you can use that like sap or um yeah what other like berries i i feel like not a lot of people know um like what the ground covers and forests can even provide and stuff like that and so that's kind of cool that you're using, mm -hmm. I guess, like weeds sometimes for for people, but it's like actual medicinal edibles. So 
Yeah, like even like dandelions are like yeah. a tremendously valuable medicinal plant and people have, you know, dandelions and chicory are like roadside weeds and people like intentionally kill them with chemicals all the time because they're like not grass. Right. Um, but, um, hmm. you know, and it's not, it's not necessarily like, I think those people are idiots or anything. Like, like, it's fine. Like, they just like aren't coming at it from a perspective of... Um, curiosity you know they're like right I know this is a weed I know I want grass goodbye weed um yeah but in reality you know chicory like as an example chicory roots are like 80 percent inulin um which is a resistant fiber um and that's like indispensable for feeding um good gut bacteria mm-hmm. um, which in turn can produce short chain fatty acids and actually help regulate mental health um mm-hmm. so there's like like the idea that you could be just like chewing on chicory roots from your yard and like getting antidepressant benefits from that yeah. uh, because of the interaction of that plant with your gut bacteria. So it's right. like, there's all these like interaction, complex interactions and even ecosystems, not just around us, but within us. Mm. Um, so uh, that's like Flora Funga Farms is like focused on, um, on those ecosystems basically okay Um, nice yeah so that was a ramble but no i love i love rambling (laughs) it's the best (laughs) (laughs) what are some of like the flora parts of your farm then that you are growing or trying to grow or um so they would vary by season so um some things are like spices so or you know like for things for herbal teeth so anything from like early spring foliage of various trees and shrubs to you know berries seeds um barks and um like um uh, resins and saps and things and then there's some things that people are a little more familiar with using like fiddleheads and ramps mm-hmm. um and so we'll be cultivating those types of things um in the the forest floor so like um for instance fiddleheads like to grow um, in very wet areas um well the ostrich fern fiddlehead which is the one that is cultivated for eating um so we'd be planting a lot of those we'd be planting a lot of ramps and trying to establish patches that we could harvest from every year um and that might take a little while before Mm -hmm. we have the ability to offer those um but there's plenty of other things that you can plant in a forest setting that you might not immediately think um, could grow there. Like um, irises do really well. Like there's a lot of different um, like cut flowers that you could do for like decorative. and Oh, that's cool too. So we're not necessarily just focused on like edible things. Um, Some stuff might also be like, um, you know, we might end up making like perfumes or oh wow yeah you kind of have like the whole yeah yeah I mean and we we probably won't stray too much into actually like preparing medicines with our stuff like for sale um because then like there's a whole regulatory system that comes into play so um we probably will be providing ingredients um and I I practice herbalism as well just on as a human so I'm, um, I'll be using that stuff to make medicine for sure, but we won't be selling medicine okay. pre-made under the Flora Funga Farms brand because, right. um, just because the FDA is set up to regulate large corporations, not tiny yeah. Yeah. companies. Uh, Would you have like videos or like recipes for people to follow if they are interested or like oh, whenever yeah. you have things up, you'll have like some media to showcase or yeah like the csas will definitely not just come with um mushrooms and plants they'll come with you know recipes and um, instructions and you know information on like the medicinal and edible like the health benefits of what they're getting in their box okay Um, the little handouts prepare it yeah because i think a lot of people have a tendency to like be curious about mushrooms um like you know like gourmet edible mushrooms and then they get them home and they just go rotten in their fridge because they don't right they're like what do i do with this yeah um and so like having just even like a simple set of like instructions for like 
a really delicious um, mushroom soup or like deep fried mushrooms or whatever, you know, like something that people can do fairly easily that doesn't require a ton of prep. Right. Uh, you know, so. Uh, what, uh, just to track back for a second, what are fiddleheads if uh, people don't know what a fiddlehead is? Yeah, so fiddlehead is like the early sprout stage of a fern. Um, and ferns are like, I'm sure most people have seen a fern before, but they're, they're a type of plant that um, is fairly primitive compared to, you know, like a flowering plant. Um, mm -hmm. They don't have flowers or seeds or fruits. Um, instead, they have spores. Yeah. Um, so they actually like produce these tiny little, a lot like a fungus, mm -hmm. these tiny little spores that germinate into like a separate life cycle of the fern plant which I won't get into because it gets really confusing <laughs> I'm not a botanist but um then that thing like meets up with another like there's like a male and a female one of this little like blib that is made from the spore and they like mate and mm -hmm. that becomes a fern and then when the fern is like coming out of dormancy like in the springtime um it's like a cur little curly Q um, sprout that like slowly unrolls itself. And oh, I love it. pick it like before it's unrolled. Um, and they do have a lot of like tannins and stuff in them. So you can eat them raw, but they're not amazing for you mm -hmm. raw. Um, they do stress the kidneys a little bit. So if you um, just like soak them in water even, or like blanch them or even like cook them fully, saute them, however, or pick okay. them works great you can ferment them so there's like That's tons good. of different ways to prepare fiddleheads and they're delicious yeah. as long as you're aller allergic to them some people do have an allergy oh that would suck no fiddleheads are really good especially like paired with mushrooms obviously um and is that uh can you pick any fern or is that just one species that you can eat or it's primarily ostrich ferns okay. um there are other species of ferns that are edible but some of them require special preparation and mm -hmm. some of them are just downright toxic. So, okay. um, and there's like traditional use of um, like around here, bracken fern, um, which is a fern with like a three branched leaf. Like it has like a, almost like a triangle of leaves. Okay. But, um, those fiddleheads are edible, but they require special preparation to remove some toxic chemicals from them. Okay. Um, so they're, They've been traditionally eaten for thousands of years um, by the native people of New England, but they're um, they're not edible raw. Okay, yeah, because what I remember picking them last year was like there's some that have like fur on them, and then some that have like the stem that kind of looks like celery stalk. Is that the one that you? Yeah, like picked? it's like slightly dented. On yeah. One. Yeah, and that's okay, let's see, yeah, that's ostrich fern. It's smooth. It doesn't have hair. Okay. And a lot of the ferns that do have those hairs, those hairs are incredibly irritating to the, mm. the eye tract, which is why they have them. So oh, um, that makes sense. A lot of like mature ferns, by and large, are toxic. So like when they're fully leafed out, um, they've become to too toxic to eat, which is why you rarely see ferns with like the leaves munched. Right. Because um, they've had hundreds of millions of years to evolve um toxins okay uh, they've been ferns have been around for forever like the first trees quote unquote were actually giant ferns um you know it's, it's fun, fun to imagine like mm -hmm. if you've ever been to the tropics like um there are some pretty big ferns like you know like 20 or 30 feet tall but like if you can imagine like a 200 foot tall fern <sighs> awesome <laughs> like a fern is thick is like the biggest time <laughs> you know what I mean like pretty wild I mean yeah. I imagine they fell over more because they weren't very yeah, they possibly. were dirty as modern trees but yeah no like the fiddlehead would be like as big as your head or something That'd like the cool. coal that we're burning a lot of that coal comes from these like ancient forests oh. um it's actually kind of fascinating the um Fungi are the reason why fossil fuels stopped being made. Okay. Years ago. So if you imagine like a forest that where the trees just fall over and they don't decompose and they just keep piling up 
and then eventually that's all buried in sediment mm -hmm. um, crushed under layers of earth and it turns into coal um but the reason why that doesn't happen to forests today is because when a tree dies it's decomposed by fungi right so as soon as fungi evolved the ability to digest lignin which is like a, a structural protein that makes wood hard um they like completely stopped the formation of coal oh uh, that's cool so like the the era where coal was formed is known as the carboniferous era mm -hmm. um and it's just because of like all the carbon that was being sequestered from the atmosphere um which is like another reason why we really shouldn't be burning all of that stuff because yeah. like it's not going to go back into the ground because now every time that um, a tree grows, it's inevitably digested by fungi and that releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Right. So by digging up all of this oil and, and stuff, we have, there's no doubt, like the idea that anyone would claim that humans are not causing changes to the climate is just ridiculous because yeah. all you have to do is look at um, deep history, you know, deep time. And you see that like, you know, after all of that carbon was sequestered into coal and oil and everything, you can see that the planet cooled dramatically. Mm. Um, you know, and this is like, like 400 million years ago. Yeah. Um, but like the earth cooled dramatically after all that carbon was stored as coal. Um, and then now we've dug it all up and burned it. So surprise, it's getting warmer. Um, <laughs> wonder why. Yeah. The positive, positive feedback loop. But yeah, so I think um, like fung flora and fungi are going to completely transform um, everything about our world. So when we finally do stop digging up fossil fuels to make everything and do mm -hmm. everything, um, you just think about how many things are made of plastic. I know. Are like, going look to around. Be, it's like, okay, like, yeah, everything is plastic is wrapped in plastic. Mm -hmm. And then all of that plastic is made from petroleum. So if we're out of petroleum or if we just give up on it, which I think we should do before we run out, um, yeah like then we'll there'll be like all of this tremendous opportunity to create new forms of packaging and new forms of like shipping materials and um just materials engineering in general will be much more focused on what kinds of materials can life generate you know yeah. so like what kinds of you know how can we like breed a fungus that has the ability to form mycelium that can be harvested for packaging. Yeah, you know, that is a cool thing or, now. Or for clothing. So there's like all of these um, material engineering firms popping up that are uh, working with fungi and plants to create um, all these new types of materials. Um, mm. that are gonna transform commerce um, as yeah. it's done. Like even, there's somebody made a boat out of mycelium. Like there's so many. Cool oh, I wonder how that works. It works great because like a lot of mycelium is um, when it's fully mature and like mm -hmm. after it's died, it becomes incredibly hydrophobic. So okay. it repels water, won't absorb water. Oh. Because of the cell walls of the fungus are so oh. like, impenetrable. Okay. Um, and sense. they have chemicals that repel water. So and that's to preserve the water inside the fungal cells, but it also works the opposite way. So once that mycelium is all dried out, mm -hmm. um, it actually will repel water uh, in oh, the same wow. way that like, you know, plastic or anything else would. Um, so you can use it for, to make leather or boats or. Yeah. Styrofoam. Hats. Yeah. Styrofoam. Yeah, no, that is interesting that, um, is that, what are you trying to send your uh, CSA packages in? I mean, I don't hate cardboard, but right. it would be cool if we could develop our own mushroom packaging. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are also like, maybe we would consider collaborating with um, a material engineering place that actually like has the lab capacity to produce that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, Cause it does take a little more like specialized equipment stuff to grow. Uh, right helium in like specific ways but it would be cool if our our 
mushroom CSAs were shipped in mushroom materials. Yeah, that'll, that'll be in the future for sure. Yeah, I mean, and you know, there are even simpler ways to make packaging that have been around for thousands of years. Um, basket weaving, uh, mm -hmm. you know, pottery. There's all different ways of, of containing things that people have, you know, that have been around since agriculture. Right. And it would be awesome if people like could use your cardboard and like put it in their mushroom beds or their garden or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Like yeah. it's got spores in it. <laughs> yeah. It helps grow mushrooms. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like those bookmarks that you get when you're younger with like uh, native seeds in it and stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I got my friend Paige always sends me postcards. Oh, that's cool. Oh, I like that. That's a great idea. Um, so do you, are you doing future events, uh, coming up with like foraging or, uh, do you have any future plans yet? Um, so with COVID we're just doing by appointment, um, okay. if people want to, um, we have two different services that we offer. So we offer the guided foraging tours. We also offer, um, like mushroom cultivation setup. Okay. Sort of like assistance. Yeah. So like help people to um, create their own um, like mushroom cultures at, on their own property or in their house or whatever. So if someone is interested in growing mushrooms and they just don't have the know-how mm -hmm. uh, and they just want someone to come help, we, we, we do that for a fee. Oh, that's um, awesome. And then there's um, obviously our end goal is to be growing mushrooms and producing them. Um, mm -hmm. but we're not, and we'll be doing workshops. Um, you know, in classes and things like that, but that's, we'll probably hold off on doing workshops until, you know, most people are vaccinated. Right. Uh, just because like, I don't want to host. Yeah. Right, right. Idea. Host a super uh, spreader. Yeah. <laughs> so like, um, yeah, until then, um, we'll be doing like by appointment guided foraging for the down, down East Maine area. Okay. That makes sense. That's cool. Um, explain some of your interests with like the, um, your ecology and holistic health and chemistry. Was that just, uh, like your permaculture and kind of how you make your own, um, medicinal tinctures or, um, what are your interests in that besides just flora funga farms? Oh yeah. So like, I'm really interested in that, in that stuff. I actually like I have narcolepsy, like a, it's a sleep disorder. Okay. Uh, I have, my brain has a hard time regulating like when I should be awake or asleep. Um, and so, and there's really not a very effective treatment available mm. through allopathic medicine. I mean, there's, it's not like there's a prescription that like fixes the imbalance. You know, right. there's no, it, it, it has to be, it's like a, it has to be a holistic approach to treat narcolepsy. I mean, there's no. Interesting. There's, otherwise, it's just a band-aid fix. I mean, yep. just, they'll prescribe you stimulants to keep you awake Ugh. so you don't crash your car. Yeah. And then it's but like, a, yeah. Stimulants are not without side effects, especially at the doses you need to take them to keep you awake. Mm -hmm. um, so I became really, I started my journey into plants and um, holistic medicine and everything because of the diagnosis. of okay. So I started learning, oh, like I, you know, I was just walking home one day and I saw these um, black locust flowers. It's like a okay. tree with these beautiful dangling white flower chain Ooh. and they're edible. They smell really good. And um, I was, I smelled them walking under them and was just like, what are these? <laughs> they smell amazing. And so I went home and like found a plant book and looked them up and realized you could eat them. And then I made a salad with like oh, wow. the flowers in them and it was really good. And like, that's one of my first like plant experiences that I had. Okay. Um, and then from there, I just like started learning more and more and more. And then I was like, oh, screw it. I'm not going to be a chemical engineer. I'm going <laughs> to be an ecologist and study plants and stuff. And then I, you know, at college for plant stuff, I discovered mushrooms. And mm -hmm. then everything else is sort of history. But yeah, I, I'm an herbalist also. So I, um, I have just a few clients I work with, like family and friends mostly. Um, 
it's like another thing I do. I don't do it for money. I do it to, to help share okay. useful, like people are just not aware of, of holistic and plant-based medicine. Right. Um, because it's not mainstream. Yet. Yeah. Um, it's becoming more mainstream slowly. Um, like the nutraceutical mar- market is bigger now. And like, um, you know, more and more people are taking supplements and, mm-hmm. and realizing the limitations of, um, you know, like the big pharma, um, yeah. big, big hospital drug, drug <laughs> sort yeah. of establishment that is like, yeah, like it's great that, you know, if you break your leg or if you have a horrible infection, you know, like modern medicine will save you. It's mm-hmm. great. It's so nice to have like emergency rooms available for when you're like bleeding. Right. <laughs> right. We still need like, those. But. It's great. Like, you know, they're really good at like taking out someone's gallbladder or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, like, you, you might not actually need to take out your gallbladder if you are supplementing with like mm-hmm. the proper plants and um, uh, the proper diet so as to not stress your gallbladder to the point where it needs to be removed. Right, Um, proactiveness. Exactly. And so like, there's this like, um, rather than like ignoring lifestyle choices, um, it's more like focusing on lifestyle. Yeah, being aware of your body. Yeah, like why, not, not what issue do you have? Why do you have any issues? I love that. Thank you. That gave me chills. (laughs) <laughs> you shouldn't have any issues if you're um if you have a complete you know understanding of, of health which no one has but yeah. um it's like you know the closer you get to understanding your own body and your own health and how you respond you know your microbiome like what bacteria are living inside your gut um you know the more information you can get about that and about um what plants work well for you mm-hmm. um, for just nutrition purposes, right? uh, that can be tremendously helpful for, um, and that's like what, you know, what I do as an herbalist. I talk when someone comes to see me about an issue they're having, it's, um, we usually talk about, you know, okay, so like, what is your life like? You know, Mm -hmm. what are you, I'm not just like, okay, like, where does it hurt? Right. what What is your life like? What has it been like? Like, you know, when's the last time you, um, had surgery or like took a course of antibiotics or like any, or like had a major stressful life event or something right. it, like all of these things are important. Like if you can't sleep at night, that's important. Mm-hmm. You know, you like all of these things matter. So like when you're talking to someone, especially if they have like issues with chronic disease, like Lyme or, um, you know, just like chronic pain from, you know, like, I don't know, like a sinus infection they had yeah. when they were like 10 years old that never went away. Oh, like all these, like things that people just live with and just like band-aid fix through their whole life. Right. Until they're like, until the problems are so bad that they kill you basically. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah so you shouldn't have like back pain or like just like I yeah, was like, having, yeah. Yeah. I, I was having some uh, knee issues and some feet issues and then so recently I was uh diagnosed with uh rheumatoid arthritis so um but so I've been taking like prescriptions for that but also I would like to know what I could do herbalistically and like now my bursitis has come back so like I don't know what started that up again or yeah what 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 do you think about that (laughs) Um, well, it's like, it's rheumatoid arthritis is like a, it's like an autoimmune inflammatory condition. So Mm -hmm. what's probably, I mean, it's, it could be a lot of different things, but what's probably going on is, um, you have like some kind of a major imbalance. Okay. Um, Just, and it's like, it could, we'd probably have to talk a lot more to like figure out. Right. Yeah. That can be a different time, but (laughs) what that is like, I'm happy to see you as a client if you want, but I don't know if you want to like put our conversation on. Yeah, no, I, I, (laughs) yeah, I got you on that, but, uh, something, yeah, that's, that's really interesting that you can like look into and and, like diet, especially like dietarily and in terms of like 
movement training mm -hmm. um, and like the combination of all of those things could okay. be really helpful for yeah we'll have to talk we'll have to talk uh, later on that because yeah. you could yeah you could take steroids or you could um, Oof, no <laughs> like just um there's like i mean like an herb an example of an herb that would be helpful for symptomatic relief would mm -hmm. be like solomon seal root okay uh, which is it's actually a rhizome but it's like a it's a plant that has a lot of these like special mucilaginous compounds in them that basically work to moisten. I mean, there's not really a better word for it. That's cool. I like it. I like that word. The joints. <laughs> Sorry. And so it's like, there's like dry, you have like this, I mean, and when I say dryness and moisture, those are like herbal energetic terms. Oh, okay. So they're not, I don't mean like it's literally dry. I just mean like, like dryness and heat are like properties of inflammation. Mm -hmm. So like, let's say like an herb like um, juniper um, is very drying and hot. And when okay. you take that herb, you will feel like flushed and hot and dry. Like it will like dry you out. Um, Interesting. And like, if you take as a counter example, an herb like mint, mm -hmm. very cooling and moistening, you will very much feel that it's a different yeah. experience. Um, and it's because, you know, these plants, plants with different energetic properties, um, those energetic properties are like basically the, the herbalist way of understanding the interaction between the whole body and the whole herb. Hmm. Um, so you, we're not working with one compound that affects, you know, one yeah. enzyme in your liver that breaks down one thing. Like, right, it's all connected. It's a, it's a full spectrum thing. So the the best way to look at it, um, or the way that's worked out really well for like ev almost every herbal tradition in the world, um, is to look at it energetically. Um, and the the way that that's looked at is different in different you know, like in Ayurveda or traditional Chinese medicine um, or Jammu in Indonesia, you know, there's all these different mm. herbal medicine traditions all over the world, but a lot of them have in common um, an energetics profile of some kind, like this idea that like a certain herb is, uh, like in Ayurveda, they have doshas okay. uh, talking about like, you know, what something is pitta or kapha, which basically is talking about like, you know, like fiery and dry or like oh. watery and cool or like airy and like um like what is it like uh, I'm trying to think uh like grounded you okay. know so there's like all these different um sort of like elemental and it's and, and that comes people like doctors well like n not like naturopaths and, and doctors that know about it but like a lot of allopathic doctors, so like people who just went to regular medical school who are very ignorant to herbal medicine will mm -hmm. say things like, um, you know, like, oh, that's like a bunch of bullshit because they hear someone say like, oh, this herb helps, um, you know, balance liver action because it has, um, because it's red. Or right. Okay. And they hear like, they hear something like that and they're like, that's stupid. These people have no idea what they're talking about. And it's like, okay, well, actually like that idea is coming from thousands of years of right. observations about herbal medicine. And it's, mm -hmm. it actually turns out then later you see a study years later that's like, oh, the compound that turns this herb red also like helps the liver. And right. you're like, oh, surprise. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. yeah. Just, anyway. Yeah, just because we don't have like a scientific article doesn't mean it doesn't work because it's been used for so many years and proven so. Our, exactly. Yeah. yeah, like thousands of years of traditional knowledge mm -hmm. is science. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. Just a different set of principles. So it's like if you're and like, yeah, like some some things that some traditions are not great. Like there's like a few traditional herbs from Europe that no, <clears throat> nobody uses anymore because they realized that they were poisoning people. Mm, mm, yeah. But it's it's really the exception and not the rule. Like that's like like yew berries, you know, like Y E W. Yep, yep. It's like a coniferous plant. 
um, is a highly, highly toxic plant, mm -hmm. um, but it's been used historically for medicine for a long time. But if you look at the things that it's been used for, a lot of toxic plants are used for things um, where you actually need that toxicity. So toxicity is like dosage dependent. Interesting. So something that's a, that could kill you because it's so toxic is also used um, in like, like atropine. Right. Uh, is a highly um, potent alkaloid that could kill you um, or like send you into a crazed hallucinatory delusional state if you like took a bunch of it or even like ate one seed from the plant that it comes mm. from. But if, but like eye doctors use it every day to dilate people's eyes. Okay. Uh, but like there's like all these really interesting. Yeah, uh, dosage matters. Yeah, just because something is you know, like foxglove is considered a very toxic plant. Yep. But like even modern medicine is like foxglove is great because like they get, you know, digoxin and these other like heart, um, these medicines that affect heart muscles. And that's what makes them poisonous because it's hard to get, it's hard to tell what the dosage is right. from the plant because like all you'd have to do is like eat a couple of flowers and your heart will stop. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. but at the same time, if you, if you, you know, just soak one of the flowers in water and then use the flower essence, the amount oh. of the chemical that you're getting is so low that you're actually able to use it for other purposes. Okay. Um, but that's like advanced. Yeah, you know, yeah. I would not advanced. try that at home unless yeah, you're. <laughs> yeah, that would be a bad idea. Just clear. But it's like you know, it's an herb like lemon balm. Go to town. You know, mm -hmm. you're not gonna overdo it. Um, okay. Interesting. So there's, yeah. so there's tons of herbs that are like tonics that are low toxicity, and you can use them every single day. And it's fact, it's great if you use them every day because they build up. You know they help you build to a balanced state over time. Hmm. The same is true of like movement practice. So, yep. you know, stretching and like, um, just like getting your body in different positions, like yoga type stuff. Yeah, like a squat or stuff yeah. like that. Just like exploring the entire full range of your body's motion every day. Yeah, no, I love doing that. As close, as close to you can as possible is a great way to prevent your body from like crumbling you know yes. like, yeah no I I totally agree um yeah with like the gym being closed by me was awful and that's when everything started like actually coming to the surface and I was like wow I can't like work out as much um so that's where I like started to feel the aches so yeah that was just like really really sad and even like the Mayo Clinic here was saying yeah so many people have come in now because they don't have a gym to go to and they're like, we don't know what to do because they are trying to reopen it, but with like a good, um, like a good process. And so they're just like, we don't know what to do with all these people that are coming in with like joint issues because they still don't have a gym to go to. And it's just like, they see what's happening and it's just very sad. Yeah, totally. And yeah. It's, yeah, that's an amazing observation too, that like, it only takes like a year of not exercising to like mm -hmm. really fuck yourself up. Um, yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. What would be, what is your like favorite herb uh, that you go to for um, your body and yeah. Um, well, one herb that I'm really, that I am really fascinated with that I don't, I don't usually go a day without taking it is um, Boswellia or frankincense. Oh, okay. So it's a resin from a tree and it has uh, incredible anti-inflammatory properties okay. uh, for the gut, for the joints, muscles, even the brain. Like it gets, mm -hmm. it gets like, cause it has all of these like interesting gums and things in it that your gut bacteria can digest. And then it also has all of these like volatile oils and like um, fat soluble compounds that okay. can pass right through your cell membranes and impact the processes going on within the cells. So um, there's like a lot of different, you have to be careful with um, supplements and herbs, like mm -hmm. especially with extracts, like where you get them. Um, there's a few companies I trust to make supplements, um, but like be very cautious, like Amazon is full of fake supplements. Yeah, uh, where would you get, where would you recommend people uh, to go to? Like. I would recommend like a, a group, a small group of companies. Um, but there's like, there's a website called iHerb. 
okay. that you can it's kind of like amazon for supplements okay and they have a more strict requirements okay that's for, good like what supplements um are on their profile like be, are on their website because they um yeah they like chain they like verify whether the ingredients on the bottle match oh nice they do like a third party testing or like they need proof of third party testing okay. before they can even host a supplement on that site and then most of the companies that i work with so um my favorites are now foods um which is one and then there's like integrative therapeutics um solaray is another one uh this company solaray okay they make decent stuff. They're a little more on like the pharmaceutical end of things. So they, they tend to use standardized extracts, which um, sometimes can leave out the more whole portions of the herb in okay. favor of like a couple scientifically studied compounds that they've extracted from the herb. Hmm. But, um, sometimes you can like, it'll say standardized extract, but it's just a regular extract that they've verified for potency. Okay. So, um, and you can kind of tell by like busting open one of the capsules and like looking at what's inside. Oh. Like, never, yeah. never be afraid to like open the capsule. Like, don't, don't let a, especially if you're like, okay, I'll risk trying a new company. Right. Like, order ginger capsules and you open a capsule and it doesn't smell and taste like ginger. It's not ginger. Yeah, that's true. Like, it's fake. Yeah. <laughs> like some, or like the same is true for like mushroom powders. Mm -hmm. There's so many fake mushroom powders on the internet right now. Yeah. It's crazy. Like so many people trying to get into like, you know, reishi mushroom, taking reishi mushroom every day because it's mm -hmm. amazing for um, lung and respiratory health as well as um, uh, just like stamina, cellular energy. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so many like fake reishi powders that I are like that. reishi 100 to one extract, like <sighs> powder. And it's like a pound and a half of it for like 15 bucks and nobody is suspicious. And yeah. like all these good reviews, like I felt great. It's like, yeah, they probably put crack in it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> who knows? Like, oh man, yeah. Like, and then someone, you'll scroll down to the, like the one, one star review. And it's like the only per person who mentions anything about like, I make my own mushroom extracts and this does not smell yeah. taste like mushroom extract. And that's like important. Like you need to try, you need to like build a, an ability to screen for yeah. what products, especially like if you, if you're harvesting from the wild, it's one thing because mm -hmm. like, you know, you can learn to identify the plant yourself, which parts you harvest and when Right. You do that. You have full control over the quality of the harvest and everything. But like when you're ordering, like when you buy a bag of coffee, yeah, like Folgers, <laughs> like pre-ground coffee, like how do you know those weren't the moldiest beans? Oh, ever? for sure. It probably like, was. And so like, it's better obviously to get whole bean coffee and it's even better to get green coffee and roast it yourself. But like, mm. no one has time for that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it's just like, um, yeah, there's a lot of problems with quality. Something. yeah yeah no i that sucks so bad that people are just really about the money and oh, yeah. uh, not really about people's health yeah and people are all about like oh i'm gonna take this supplement and it's gonna fix me you know they, right they apply this allopathic um medicine standard of of how things are supposed to work to mm -hmm medicine and it just doesn't work that way right it works much better when you apply holistic healing to modern medicine um in that direction it works great but the mm. other direction it doesn't it doesn't really work yeah it shouldn't be the band-aid you should find your root issue and fix it that way yeah and if like if you're at the doctor for an hour and half an hour of that is you doing paperwork in the waiting room and the other half an hour is them writing you a prescription and taking your blood pressure at what point are they actually finding out about your life and why you're sick? Yeah, no, they never ask about diet or exercise. Like they think it's not their business or something. And I'm like, yeah. absolutely your business. Um, right. And I'm, I'm pretty lucky. Like my, the doctor that I see is very open to these things. And like when I, you know, I've talked to them about the herbs and stuff that I've used 
to, mm -hmm. I do take prescriptions too. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, so there's definitely a place for modern medicine. It's just like, it's just a small part of, you know, a bigger picture. Right. Hopefully. Understood. But anyway, so in terms of stuff you need for the podcast, um, are there any questions that I haven't answered yet? Yeah. Um, let's see. How did Flora Funga Farms idea change you and your meaning of life? Um, so I guess like I originally was, uh, or like, I don't know, like 10 years ago, my plan was to uh, go to school for chemical engineering and then like make a bunch of money and retire at like 40 years old. <laughs> calculated it all and <laughs> yeah it's like all about it I was like yeah just grind it out until I'm almost dead and then um and then live a sad retired life oh, uh, God. so I uh you know got exposed I got exposed to um holistic healing and to herbs and plants and fungi in college and just like uh, completely switched my life goals around. So, um, and then I guess like Flora Funga Farms specifically, like coming up with the idea that I don't have to like, just like grind nine to five every day. Mm -hmm. And that I could be instead like spending all of my time and energy doing what I love. Um, and like Flora Funga Farms is like, potentially a way for me to do that and also have that be my career and you know there's always this saying like if you do what you love you never feel like you worked a day in your life right um, and I think that can be true but I also do have there are I've noticed like it can be um, difficult like trying to depend on what you love as your income it can actually cause burnout like you can get a little burnt out on the thing that you love to do if you're like just doing it all the time and yeah like it becomes associated with this money stress um so it's it's kind of interesting but i'm i'm hoping that everything works out well and that um you know this virus mm -hmm. is done at some point <laughs> yeah or like at in, least yeah yeah because it would be not great to be able to hold workshops and classes and i think that would be a large a large part of how we made our how we made our money to continue. Um, Cause I think we would probably be losing money on um, the CSAs and things in order to be offering them at an affordable price. Cause yeah. like, we definitely don't want to just offer our products and services to like rich people. Like, right. Everyone. Yeah. want to have like sliding scale available for everything. Like we want everyone to be able to afford to get access to um, like whole natural foods from their local ecosystem right yeah that would be the goal so hmm. it's changed a lot about my entire perspective on life yeah uh, but also just like the experience of coming into um the lifestyle that i'm in now just like being so focused on nature um has really changed everything right so then how do you stay motivated every day to like keep going with your projects and um like sometimes that? some days i don't <laughs> yeah no everybody um, has that. I think that yeah i think that's okay like yeah. i think that's how i stay motivated is i don't i am obsessed yes but i don't i don't let it like stress me out okay if i'm like oh i don't want to like deal with like looking through my finances today mm -hmm. then I just won't yeah and I will just find something else to do that doesn't sound like a pain in the butt right and you like, do yeah I'll find a time when it is you know when everything is more convenient you know I'm, I'm making my own schedule at this point so um it's yeah there's always time for for like uh patience or waiting. yeah yeah no I like that answer huh. so then like tell me about a time where you questioned your future and like your purpose with that or is that yeah well a lot of that has to do with um 
I had some experiences with uh, what people call teacher plants, um, you know, like psychedelics. Um, so like psilocybin mushrooms, um, my experiences with those a number of years ago mm -hmm. had a pretty profound impact on, on my, um, just my like openness. Okay. Yep. New concepts and ideas. Um, and like also it just like really helped me to take control of my, and it sounds cheesy, but like to take control of my destiny in a way, mm -hmm. like, and to take control of my happiness. Um, like before I was like, oh, I'm miserable. And like, I hate that I have to work for the money and all this, like, yeah. oh, I have to be human. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, after my experiences with uh, these various teacher plants mm -hmm. uh, and fungi, it, I found like unlimited joy in experiencing the natural world. So oh, it's like, I, I went from like completely dissatisfied with life um, for as long as I can remember, um, you know, occasionally having fun too. Right. But like most of the time when I wasn't having fun, I was miserable. Yeah. Um, so now it's like, I'm pretty joyful all the time, mostly just because I have an unlimited source of joy in yeah. the backyard. Um, yeah. You enjoy the little things and all I have to do is just get lost in the woods and I forget everything else. So I like that. Uh, we had a listener ask, um, what is the process like to start your own farm to table company? Um, it's, I guess it's complicated. It helps if you, uh, if you're not doing everything. So okay. it helps if you are, um, just doing part of it. Like collaboration is, is really key. Okay. So running a restaurant is a completely different thing from running a farm right. uh, so like it would be really helpful uh for any farm to table operation to work with an existing restaurant um right. or even like for a restaurant to work with an existing farm or vice mm -hmm. versa but like so a farm could in theory start up and build itself around the restaurants in its community that are interested in you know farm to table produce um and so it's like yeah, it's kind of like two different things. It's two different businesses, really. So okay. collaboration is key. I yeah. Guess. yeah, so that would be like your advice if people want to um, create their own flora funga farms. Yeah, it's like the process is, yeah, it's really just about like, um, I don't know, it's it's like an exploration. Sorry, the, the weather outside is crazy right now. <laughs> That's fine. Um, Boop, boop, boop. what was I saying got distracted uh the advice of how collaborating would be beneficial for starting like a farm to table oh, type of yeah. the more people that you can get to help you like you know if you can find an existing farm that's willing to lease you some land mm -hmm. you know um on there that already has good soil and stuff you know like things like that like if you're trying to um, start a more traditional style farm um, that's not like a food forest type thing, yeah. um, then it's, you know, it would be helpful to have like, yeah, to have people and, and businesses to collaborate with. Um, the more you do that, the easier, the less will be on you, you right. know, to hold the whole thing together. Yeah. Um, and like, yeah, establishing good relations, working relationships with the people who are going to be your partners uh, <laughs> is, is key to you. So succeeding. I mean, I can't pretend to know a lot about succeeding in this business because I'm literally just starting. So yeah. um, I've well, been fairly successful are. with the foraging tours. Uh, I've done quite a bit of that. But the as for the farming, we'll have to like do another interview at like two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. I would love to uh, follow up. And yeah, so you so you're pretty much starting with like um, foraging and that's kind of how you're getting your um, what would you call it? Like people involved or like your community? Is that how you're building people to know about flora funga farms or? Yeah, it's like the, a way to get people interested and aware and also just like um, 
you have to build a, a client base of people who, um, you know, like to go for it on these guided foraging tours mm -hmm. uh, every year or so. Okay. Um, uh, I've even have a couple people who I go like multiple times a year. Okay. Um, and I'll take people out like in their own, sorry, snow keeps falling off the roof. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, but I'll take people on their own property. Um, so they're able to like learn about what's growing in their own backyard that they can use for food and medicine. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a great option too, because some people like don't want to go out and do that. And so it'd be nice. Yeah. You can come to them. It's a good idea. Are you a part of like any other communities, either like on Facebook or in your uh city or yeah, so I'm part of like every mushroom group that exists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, same i'm not on like a lot of, there's like a lot of goofy ones that i that i'm not really on okay it's like a lot of, like there's like a lot of ri ridiculous ones out there and then there's some that are just overgrown like you know mushroom identification page on facebook that has like millions of people yeah on it and like half of them are trolls yeah so it's like, um but like the you know like there's state and like local groups so i actually started um the Mother island mushroom club and we Ooh. have like, almost 300 members now okay uh, started that like i don't know a year ago or so okay so that's like a local group and we just like schedule free foraging opportunities for people who are interested oh um, that's cool and uh yeah and then mm -hmm. like other otherwise like you know on facebook there's tons of communities um, for holistic healing as well as for like um, mushroom everything from like mushroom identification to cultivation to um, yeah like making medicine and crafts and stuff yeah, yeah Facebook's got everything yeah. if you want a page to find <laughs> yeah Facebook has and you can create your own community that's true and I don't love Facebook um, as a corporation but I think that um, the opportunity they've created to to connect people is is pretty fantastic yeah i feel like that's really how i use facebook too is like i've been doing way more zoom like meetings with cool like mycological societies right now just because i'm have so much downtime at home in the winter so i'm like oh let's see what other weird societies i can just like join and like usually they have speakers or it's just fun to find a community of people that is like yourself and yeah so what is like a typical day in the life of willow at flora funga farms so in the summer like when we're actually doing things so i would you know i get up and go out to the um to the, our like r d greenhouse thing and just like check the conditions so i just have to like make sure that um, the humidity and the temperature and everything are, are within the ranges they're supposed to be. Um, I just check to make sure that there's no contaminants growing or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, and I do, you know, whatever has to be done to the, the mushrooms that are growing. So whether that's like, you know, opening, a lot of them are in bags and things. So like you might need to open the bag to let them breathe or something, or, okay. um, you know, depending on the day, we might be like inoculating substrate or we might be transferring fully grown mycelium to a bulk substrate or like to their final um so we do like some mushrooms on the ground in beds mm -hmm. like in a garden setting kind of and then we do some um like we were saying in in live trees and then as well we do some in like hanging bags oh yep okay like a, a pretty common technique uh for growing oyster mushrooms okay so you can just imagine like it's i mean unfortunately we're using plastic because um we well we're using plastic that we got our hands on anyway we didn't have to buy it so yeah we have this big roll of plastic bags and we're just gonna use those try to recycle them as much as we can um until they're gone and then we'll come up with something else um, but okay. we have like a thousand feet of plastic bags so it's like a that'll last us a while yeah and yeah you just like put little holes in the these columns the mushrooms fruit right out of the oh, so cool. it's pretty wild but yeah so in the summer yeah so get up do mushroom stuff 
check on everything. And then like, if I have, um, you know, people call me to schedule forays or email me or something, mm -hmm. I'll like usually, um, they usually like swing by my place and I hop in their car and we go foraging wherever they're, wherever they're interested in going. And sometimes it's, yeah. it's tourists um, who are visiting Mount Desert Island. Mm -hmm. uh, and then sometimes it's uh, locals who are interested in learning about what's in their own backyard. So. Right. Oh, that's cool. And then I'll do sometimes um, I offer an optional cooking class. Ooh. So like, if we collect, uh, you know, if we have a successful forage and we find lots of good edible food, mm -hmm. uh, then we go, I also show them like how to, how to cook it up. And then we have like a little mushroom meal together. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. And so I've, been able to, oh, it's okay. I've been able to do that. Um, even with COVID um, it's pretty, pretty doable with the whole um, masks and social yeah and right it's like outside so yeah and so I just have like yeah we'll just be outside I use my camp stove and oh uh, nice oh. area or something by the ocean yeah, yeah. So it's, fire it's, mushrooms people really dig the experience um you know just being out in the woods like every time we get back in the car at the end like most people are like wow it's like we just came back from another world <laughs> yeah like you did that's outside yeah <laughs> like that's the problem is that like the human world has become so separate yeah oh from man nature and nature like honestly is perfect yeah like everything is like all together yeah you know, beautiful crystallized puzzle and it's like millions and millions of years of co-evolution of species and then we're like, oh, I'm just going to watch TV and be sad. Yeah, right. Be inside, watch. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. Some people, like, don't even go camping. Some people, yeah. like, haven't Probably ever been camp. outside. Like, <laughs> like yeah. in the woods. Nobody There's is like. There's out there. <laughs> gross. Ew. It's dirty out there. Yeah. I mean, I get that if you like, if, you know, people who are, like, born and raised in a city. Mm -hmm. it makes sense that you would have trouble adjusting to you know like I've been out on foraging with people and they've been like jumping every time a squirrel goes by you oh, know geez. Like, oh, yeah. We're from the <laughs> city. Um, but no shame I mean I think I I encourage people who are from the city to to challenge their experiences and yeah to, Agreed. To, try, to try it try hiking yeah you know? just go outside just yeah. step Leave outside phone in your car and just like, don't do anything too crazy. But <laughs> just, go look, just go look around in the woods, find some bugs and stuff. Yeah, and, so true. Oh, uh, what do you want people to remember you as? Or what is your legacy that you would want? Interesting question. Mm -hmm. I suppose I, yeah, would like to be remembered for, mm, I don't know, I feel like it's more like the, not so much, yeah, like I don't really care if people remember me, mm -hmm. but I think the ideas that I'm fascinated by, like my interests and things, um, like my enthusiasm for nature and for learning um, and my curiosity, I yeah. think are traits worth remembering. I like uh, that. Yeah. That's a good I, twist I, I on it. I'm not like in love with myself or anything, but. Yeah, no, I uh, like that. You got yeah. creative with the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I don't know, yeah, it's hard to say. I, yeah. wasn't, I wasn't expecting that one. Yeah, no, it uh it shows a lot about like people's character on how I don't know you like redirect it in a different way which is cool I like that uh how do you think flora and fungo will influence the future and are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future um 
definitely optimistic, uh, especially with like the, you know, we're on the precipice of so many massive changes in society, mm -hmm. um, economics and everything else. I mean, like, not only are we about to transition into like, um, you know, cryptocurrency is becoming more True. widely yeah, as, as, as currency. Uh, so the way that we're thinking about money in society and the transfer of value and goods is changing and um, we're almost out of oil. So um, that's gonna be a huge transition. You know, everything from like all our food is transported with fossil fuels. So that's it's true. like, you know, a really good example is like Hawaii, um, the, the big island of Hawaii had, uh, you know, before it was colonized by white people mm -hmm. had like, I think about a million people living there and 100% of their food and goods were from the island. They didn't get, or from the surrounding ocean. They didn't mm -hmm. get anything imported. Right. Now there's 1.5 million people living there and 90% of all goods are imported. Whoa. So, so it's like the fun, fundamentally we've, we've fundamentally changed the way that human beings interact with their environment um, yeah. and the way that we procure food. And I think that when we run out of the fossil fuel, that it's just allowing us to kind of like cheat and not care and like, yeah, like, fuck it. We'll get avocados from Mexico and <laughs> like, we'll get dragon fruit from Hawaii and yeah. just fly it all around the world, whatever, like who cares? It's like, yeah, it's weird. Yeah, that when, is like, weird. You could get everything you need from your local ecosystem. Um, yeah. it, and there's a few places in the world where it would be much more difficult, um, especially like if you have like a whole city of people, that's mm -hmm. another problem. It's like when you have a whole city full of people, the problems are like exponentially multiplied. Hmm. The problems with food systems and food distribution um, and being able to like um, sustainably extract those resources from your ecosystem um, is very difficult if you have a city of like 50 million people. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. So you kind of need big ag for big cities and they're very um, tied. So I don't know, like flora and fungi are, are the future. Mm -hmm. you know, like everything that we're like, all of our, our fuel and our energy and everything is gonna be coming from, for a, at least a little while, yeah. uh, from plants and mushrooms. And yeah. more and more, uh, like more and more fungi are being like they're working on like genetically engineering yeast to produce ethanol more quickly from, mm. um, so they'll be like in, you know, in maybe 10 years from now, they'll be able to produce like probably like 10 times as much ethanol in, you know, a short period of time for, for use in like vehicles and stuff. Oh, like, that's interesting. Uh, or as fuel, you know, or even mm. like, and in the same way that you can create ethanol from, sugars and stuff you can also di use biodigesters to convert stuff like cellulose and like you know even just like organic you know garbage for lack of a better mm -hmm. word um detritus and stuff you can convert that into natural gas which can be again it's not the best system because you're still burning releasing carbon and there's that whole issue mm -hmm. yeah um, but until we figure out fusion power or something it'll be oh yeah it'll be a while until we can just like make unlimited energy from water. You know? Right. But right. it'd be great. Once we get to that point, then it's like, there'll really be an explosion in um, like, I feel like a lot of the, the reasons why society as a whole, like globally doesn't, isn't, you know, like evenly saturated with holistic medicine and these ideas. Um, and, you know, like even just like, ecosystem management like the idea of an ecosystem being more important than like expanding a market or mm. uh, uh or a, a city 
or something. Like, I think that that perspective could shift if we're no longer needing to like extract all of our resources from the earth, you know? Right. So like, there's this concept of like, I don't, you know, like manifest destiny or like, you know, like that it's man's God given right to dig up whatever the fuck they want yeah. and burn it and whatever else, you know? And it's like, I think that has caused a major loss of like respect. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, it's through, you know, transforming the food system and transforming the way we think about food and plants and ecosystems and medicine. I think that's like the, I don't know. I think it's inevitable that we'll end up sort of coming back to the land. Um, it's that or just like we fail to thrive. No. Yeah, yeah. We come back to the land uh, to some degree and like preserve the ecosystems of the earth or we continue on the path we're on now and just destroy everything. Yeah. And what do we have? Like a, we'll have to live in bubbles. <sighs> you know what I mean? Like we'll have to like make our own atmosphere to have breathable Right, life. right. So the idea that we could like possibly decimate the entire planet into a desert is pretty horrifying. Yeah, that would be so I, I'm glad that there's not enough fossil fuels for us to do that. Mm. Um, but that makes sense. I'm also, yeah, so I'm like really looking forward to seeing in my lifetime the changes in global, like, the global ecosystem. Yeah. The global ecosystem, like human ecology in general um, is fascinating. And it's weird how separated we've become from nature, even though we are nature. Like, yeah. It's... Like there's nothing unnatural about human beings building a city. It's like ants making an ant mound, but it's counterproductive the way we're doing it. Mm -hmm it's not sustainable yeah it's it's sad that we're probably just gonna like wait it out until we like need to change something but we need to do that prior to like running out of fossil fuels or um stuff like that so hmm. one of the surprising uh not that there's a ton of benefit to covid but one of the surprising benefits of covid has been like astonishing innovation mm -hmm. so we'll have but like completely like corporations that were like no we would never want our employees to work from home they'd never yep. get it done are realizing actually our employees are getting 10 times as much more done yeah. at home because they're not stressing out in traffic every day and all this other shit like yeah. sitting with the, their coworker who they hate or whatever you mm -hmm. know That's so true. it's like uh just things like that like you know business people thought they knew how everything was working the best it could mm -hmm. and then COVID comes, throws a wrench in the entire economic system. And within a couple months, people have found a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, if we can make that work, then we can make no fossil fuels work. Yeah. Like, it's doable at this point. And yeah. I mean, as long as we're like, I mean, if you like, I won't talk about the stock market too much, it's, <laughs> it's but like, um, like Tesla, for example, yeah. is like, almost at a thousand dollars a share and that's just goes to show you that like you know a few years ago any you know intelligent business person mm -hmm. would be like, Bet it, like don't invest in tesla are you stupid like that's like <laughs> a fake company like they're not a real company they're just like a stupid idea that some hippies had you know what right. i mean like, electric cars will never be feasible there's not enough lithium in the world you know like they mm -hmm. used to say all these things that were just like oil company slogans to get people to continue to buy oil. Yeah, that's uh, true. So it's like, uh, now we found out, oh, there's more than enough lithium and uh, space is full of lithium. And um, cool. yeah, so there's, there's plenty of resources to make electric cars and not yeah. planet. But. Huh. So, so how do you think people can get involved to like help make a difference with flora and funga? Um, I don't know. I think finding those communities, 
um, whether th it's through online or, or, you know, local mycological societies or botanical societies, um, finding these communities of people who are already studying and interested and tapped in to uh, flora and fungi and the study thereof. Hmm. Uh, that's probably the best thing you, that you can do is just like find these people who are already involved mm -hmm. and then just try to tap them for. Yeah, find some mentors. All of us are like so willing and excited to share. Yeah. Like the more people we have to teach about this stuff, the more we learn and the more we move humanity closer to living sustainably on our planet. Yeah, that's kind of why I started this podcast because I wanted to educate people and um, I couldn't really find any podcasts on like plant physiology or uh, mycology how I wanted. So I was like, fuck it, I'll just make my own. <laughs> <laughs> so and now I can share people's ideas with like um, people like you coming on and being like oh I, I want this idea or I want to move this way but I don't really want to be specifically a part of that but I want somebody to listen and move that idea and bounce each other's ideas off each other and so I'm I'm excited about I don't know getting more education out there for everyone to listen to. And then, so what are you most excited about with like your field of study? It's hard to pick one thing. I think I'm, I'm really, really excited about learning more about the complex interactions between the gut microbiome mm -hmm. and also the microbiome of um, like the forest and the soil and how those two are actually um, connected and, and related. Oh. Um, and I have some interest, I may eventually go back to school um, to get a degree as a, as a naturopathic doctor. Okay. Um, and that would allow me to practice medicine as well um, and pres like be literally prescribing people right. uh, holistic plant-based medicine wow, instead. That's awesome. Um, and also, you know, be able to prescribe them whatever actual prescriptions they need as well. Right. As a naturopath, you're an actual doctor. Okay. You also know, you know, acupuncture. Mm. And oh, I want to try that really bad. Oh yeah, seeing a naturopath is like the best decision you you could ever okay. make. Okay, so, like and the acupuncture. Yeah, I mean, like, and depending on what, like, naturopaths know, like a wide variety of mm -hmm. techniques, and so if acupuncture is a little out there for you, then um, they will still have tons of very useful things. Hmm. I mean. I'm, like, I'm not someone who, I, I used to be someone who was very much like, oh, like, no, like modern medicine is real and like Reiki and stuff is fake. And, you know, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not that simple. It's, um, you know, that's a very dogmatic view. Yeah. Uh, and like energy healing is just as important um, and valuable as, you know, as, you know, physical healing with macromolecules. Um, so it's, you know, the intention, it's like, there wouldn't be a placebo effect if intention and mm. um, like mind power, you know, didn't affect your health. Right. Like the reason that there's a placebo effect is because if you think you're getting medicine, you're giving yourself medicine. Right. You know, no, that's, that's so nice. it's like, you know, like people who are committed to getting better, um, like when they're sick, almost always get better faster mm -hmm. um, than people who are like resigned to being sick. Right. That makes sense. And people who are really into like Reiki and homeopathy and um, like other forms of energy based healing are also like very good at getting better from sickness. Mm. Um, like, so it's, it's not like a completely, it's not like it's like a made up thing. Like it really does work. It's just like, it's a different approach. Right. Um, and it's part of, you know, a holistic approach. Okay. It's like if 
taking uh, ibuprofen for neck pain is like, you know, one side of things, then like just using the power of your mind to relax your neck. Right. Like an equally effective treatment that might have more benefits in the long term. Um, it's like if you can create your own pain relievers on purpose mm -hmm. with your own body, then you don't need pain relievers. Right. But it takes a lot of, um, anyway, I'm rambling. No, I love it. Don't ever apologize for rambling. <laughs> um, so would that be like research that you would uh, be into if you had like endless funds, the whole connection of uh, the flora in your gut and the soil, or is there something else that you would look into? Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like just like interacting with people in my local community and bringing <laughs> them closer to the to nature and to health and happiness. Yeah. Okay. That's like, what I like that. Yeah. I like that. What advice then would you give your younger self if you could go back? <laughs> um, pay more attention to the natural world. Like I was so into video games and stuff. <laughs> Start young. <laughs> Just like sitting there on my screen all yeah. the time. I mean, when I was a little, little kid, I was like out catching frogs and stuff. But then like, you know, the technology boom mm -hmm. happened. I was totally sucked into YouTube and Facebook yeah. on my dial up connection. <laughs> Waiting 20 minutes for my YouTube video to buffer. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Back when YouTube were, was like not even. Those were the days. <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, um, I feel yeah. my past self to get off my ass and go look for bugs or something yeah that's great advice yeah I think everybody should just take take at least like a walk a day you know mm -hmm. like right now it's cold but get like, movement in yeah it's like if you if you're on a trail and you know where you are and you're or like on a paved path like mm -hmm. sometimes that's all you have access to like you know in Mississippi um it's like a lot of the cities and towns in Mississippi are just like flat concrete, maybe some pine trees, but like mm. plants and pine trees, like in a row. Not oh. like, like there's, oh. no, there's like no like nature as you know it. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, available to recreate in. So like, you know, it's you, when you encounter a ton of people down there who are like, you know, extremely obese or like, and not that obese people only live in Mississippi, like they're everywhere. Yeah, yeah. No judgment. They're everywhere. Some, yeah, like no judgment on obese people. Like they probably have microbiota issues and, you know, other things going on that are leading to that. Mm -hmm. But also it's just the lack of opportunity for like nature time. Right. Like you need to soak it in, <laughs> you know, like uh, I don't know how everyone in the city doesn't just like go nuts. I, Yeah. I mean, I need like, like, this is awesome. The sun right now on my face just like feels great. And I feel like it's just been cloudy and people need more sun in their life as well. Yeah. Um, do you have any resources or books that you would recommend people um, to learn more about flora and funga or even about starting their own farm or company? Oh yeah, so um there's a bunch of really good books to check out um for as for farming there's a book called the new organic grower um and that's by who, who is guy's name is elliot coleman um and he's he has a farm up here in maine that is pretty incredible um and he he has a lot of really interesting philosophies and ideas about agriculture and permaculture um and just like growing food in general, working mm. with soil, building soil. And then there's also a really good book by Lisa Genora called Herbal Constituents. And it's like a intro to the chemistry of herbal medicine. Oh, so it breaks so down herbal medicine into like its basic chemical principles. Okay. And it really helps, especially if you remember anything from high school chemistry, like it really helps 
to um, to connect uh, like an, a basic understanding of you know how chemicals and drugs work in the mm -hmm. body, and then connecting that to okay, so like these plants actually are containing these chemicals and they're working on these various systems, and um, actually like and normally that's kind of a reductionist way to look at things like to break a plant down to its chemical constituents mm -hmm. but lisa janora is very much like a she's very aware of like the need for like holistic okay uh, of plants oh, so i love that i'm gonna have to look that book up oh yeah that, it's an amazing book okay um, i would very much recommend it and it's and the way it explains chemistry is very digestible okay like you might have to like watch a youtube video or two to like you know learn what they're talking but it's like she does a pretty good job of of explaining everything that she talks about so there's like a good glossary and everything so you don't you won't be like i don't know any of these words okay you know? like it's not know. like an organic chemistry textbook it's yeah. not like um you know? <laughs> yeah your molecule uh, tattoos oh my God. but yeah. it's like yeah it's um you know, why, why does echinacea make your tongue tingle? Oh, um, oh my gosh. I'm going to have to, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll have to put and the. Affects the immune system. And so like, there's all these things you can come to associate certain tastes and smells. You can actually learn to use your nose and tongue as like a portable chemistry lab to oh, detect different yeah. kinds of molecules and yeah, like know sense. what they are. So like when I'm smelling pine resin, I'm like, mm, alpha pinene, you know, like I can yep, like yep. smell and recognize these like individual volatile oils and things that are common to many different types of plants. So like right. you might find the same terpenes in, you know, a cannabis flower, mm -hmm. pine resin, um, an orange peel, you know, like all of these different completely genetically unrelated plants um, that have come to produce the same types of chemicals yeah. that also not only do they smell good but they have effects on your health um whether you're just smelling them right. or actually consuming them or applying them to your skin like so much yeah stuff. like the essential like, oils my understanding of chemistry really facilitated um okay in a big way all of the understanding of everything that came after so okay. like because chemistry is is truly an amazing discipline. I mean, you really, you're understanding everything in the universe. Right. Yeah, everything has come at its, at its like smallest individual character level, you know, at its elemental level. You're able to visualize, you know, you can hold a plastic bottle in your hand and you're able to visualize the individual molecules that make up the polymer of the plastic. Oh, wow. You're able to feel, you know, oh, it's flexible in this way, but it breaks in this way. And you can actually think about, you know, in what way does the molecular structure create those conditions? You just blew my uh, mind. Yeah. <laughs> I love the passion. Yeah. I love it. Chemistry yeah. is amazing. Yeah. It really helps um, bridge the gap between modern medicine and holistic healing. Mm-hmm. I'm all about bridging the gap. All of that, yeah. I love it. Yeah, I'll have to put uh, those books in the show notes. I'll I'll have to grab those titles from you again so I can write them down and find them. Um, and so where can people find you and future events that you hold? Um, I'm on the, you can just Google Flora Funga Farms. Hey. You'll find me a bunch of places. Okay. Um, I'm on Facebook, Instagram um also on uh what is it called like trip advisor and, and oh yeah all of those things um so you can just find me you can even message me straight through google like you can just google flora funga farms and then it pops up it's the first thing mm -hmm. and it's like a business click thing and then okay. you just message and you just can message like, you message just yeah. two clicks you're only two clicks away exactly i, I <laughs> tried to make it easy for people to find us yeah uh, um yeah and i feel like that's how you found me because yeah it's totally funga. Yes. trying to create my web presence and then i was just checking to see where i was positioned in the google search mm -hmm. and, and so it's like oh cool podcast yes 
Yes, I love it. Um, is there anything else that I've missed that you want listeners to know about? Mushrooms are cool. Hey. I might have said that already. <laughs> Mushrooms are friends. Fungi are friends. I love it. Yeah. And food. Fungi are friends and food. I love it. That would be the caption of this. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'll have to, uh, we'll have to like meet up whenever you fully release um, Flora Funga Farms and because you have also uh, an additional business partner that kind of deals with more of the flora side or are you kind of also doing both or? Yeah, at this stage, we're, we're really in a collaborative process. Okay. Um, and then later on, once we have everything all set up, we'll be much more, I think, like, you know, managing respective sides of the business. Um, but it's at this point, it's very it's very much collaborative, like okay. we, we split expenses and, and share. Um, and like, she helped me prepare my responses for today's interview, you know? Nice. So like, yeah. We, after, if we do another interview at some point, you'll get to meet. That's yeah, I would, I would love to uh, have yeah. both of you back on. And We both went to the same um, really strange miniature hippie college. So. <laughs> I mean, it's not the best advertisement for them. They're actually, it's a really cool school. Yeah. Uh, they're at like accredited university and everything. Um, and what was that? Expensive as colleges go. It's College of the Atlantic. Okay. Uh, their, their slogan is life-changing, world-changing, which I think is actually pretty accurate. Uh, hmm. I wouldn't recommend it for people who stray out of high school. Um, it requires a lot of self-discipline. Okay. Um, because you have a lot of freedom to create your own curriculum. Yeah, so, that's really cool. Like, there are classes offered from like 20 professors. And so you can take like whatever classes you want, um, three, per, three or four per term, you know, mm -hmm. and three trimesters. Um, so usually you take like nine classes a year, but you can do more than that if you're crazy. And, right. <laughs> and um, yeah. It's just a really amazing school. Um, tons of opportunities for like um, ocean research and stuff as well. Um, unfortunately, the botany professor who I was musing about um, mm. is no longer working there. He works over in California now. Oh, wow. That's a big switch from Maine. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, um, he's from Sri Lanka anyway. So it's, okay. more, I think Maine was a little dark and cold for him. <laughs> But he, he, he was a really cool dude, um, very, very much inspired me to become interested in plants. And I got a lot of my um, teaching skills uh, from learning from him because he's, uh, he would take us on walks in the woods and like, you know, like our, that would be like our class. Like we'd mm. go walk through the woods, follow him on some trail. And then he'd like stop and be like, okay, like what family is this plant in? Yes. Just, like, went to oh. a plant, and we'd all be like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> plant. <laughs> plant it's green and then like we uh you know by the end of it like every one of us was like the way we would study for tests and stuff was to like find our friends who weren't in the class and like take them out and like yeah the the plants of of oh that's a fun way to learn the native plants of the ecosystem yeah and so like in that class I learned like every woody plant that grows around here yeah. and it was like incredible I went from knowing like two of them mm -hmm. to knowing like 150. Wow. Yeah, that's really cool. 10 weeks, you know, like just like the amount of um, just like how much that knowledge transformed me. It's like being able to read, like that's the level of trans transformation yeah. that, that it has on your life. Like being able to recognize different species of plants and fungi mm -hmm. is like literacy it's like yeah. nature literacy like when you when you look at when i look at the forest now i don't see a forest i see like uh, like an infinitely deep community of individuals and uh, like interacting with one another you know over time oh, i love it like, like i used to look at a forest and be like yeah that's the thing with trees on the side of the road you know? yeah yeah no it's so yeah. fast <laughs> it's like when you look at it's like 
you can know what a book is, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean you know anything about what's written in it. You know, mm. in the same way, like you can know what a forest is, but to actually have even a basic understanding of what a forest is about, right? Why it's there and yeah. what it's doing for the for the planet and for itself and for all the organisms involved. Um, you know, and most of the time, the people who are you know chopping the whole forest down to build a parking lot, they haven't read the book. You know, they haven't. Like, yeah. they don't know how to read the forest that they're destroying. Right. Why right. they're destroying it. Because they don't, if they knew the value, the true value that it had, um, they would be a lot more careful um, and conscientious about, you hmm. know, how they interact cool. with the ecosystem. Yeah. It's like, yeah, like, I, I feel, it's not like I feel terrible every time I cut a tree down, because, like, I do, we'll still cut trees down. It's just mm -hmm. like, um, I'm much more aware of, you know, the impact of my actions. Yeah. And you're using it and reusing it and yeah, you're, you, you're using it to its full potential instead of just cutting down a tree because you want to cut down a tree. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, and I'm, I'm not like anti tree cutting, like mm -hmm. you can cut trees to like build a house or whatever, but like, just make sure you don't cut like too many. Yeah, yeah. Like, like if, you, if you can cut trees from the forest without, you know, completely destroying the structure of the soil and the understory and everything, then go for it. Right. There's no, beavers do it all the time. <laughs> like, Love it. <laughs> yes, nice. Well, thank you for uh, being a guest on here. And I love talking to you. I feel like we could just like go on and on about so many topics, but. I should probably clean this house before they get back. <laughs> what is summer bird arts? Summer bird arts. Oh, I don't know why. That's your name on uh, not, Zoom? Yeah, on Zoom. I have no idea. Every time I um, <laughs> get on Zoom, it, uh, it changes my name to something random. You don't to summer no to summer bird arts like oh I, oh. I don't know why. All right, <laughs> it'll be a mystery that we'll never solve. Yeah, I I have literally no clue. There That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, well, I will let you go, and uh, yeah, we'll have to um, do another another chat soon with both of you and an update on Flora Funga Farms. Sweet. Thanks Sweet. for having me on the show. Yeah, thank you. I will uh, talk to you later and I hope you have a great, what day is it? I guess uh, have a good week. <laughs> I was like, is it a weekend? I don't even know. It is the day of twos. Okay, twos, yes, Tuesday, 16th. All right, well, thank you again. Adios. It was a joy talking to you. Bye, Willow. Bye.